Um, the, this is a special topics course that is cross-listed between farming and ecological agrarianism as well as the English department. It is uh, subtitled The Writings of Wendell Berry. Um, throughout the semester, we have uh, really done a, a really comprehensive survey of Wendell Berry's writing, including his nonfiction, poetry, and fiction. Uh, we've looked at interviews. We've looked at uh, writers who have influenced his work. Uh, we've looked at secondary criticism and different kinds of uh, theory uh, that pertain to his work. And the students have just really done a great job delving into the complexities of rural community and uh, farming and agricultural issues, as well as um, a variety of uh, issues pertaining to ecology and nature and environment. Um, and so this is this event today is a result of a collective effort uh, by members of this class, the membership, uh, fittingly, uh, of this class. Um, we have, um, I will embarrass them because that is my duty. Um, <laughs> we have with us today, uh, in this particular class, there are four students and uh, one visiting community member. Um, who uh, participate, and we have uh, two of those students with us today. One was called away for a very, very important soccer game. The other was uh, called away for a family emergency. So uh, representing the class today are uh, Michelle Dunaway, who is a graduating English major, um, whose area of, uh, of expertise is in creative writing, but she's as all good English majors, she has studied literature and theory and the whole gamut of, of uh, subjects. And then we have Addison Crawford, who is also a senior here. Yeah, that's the close. The, he is not. We have embraced him lovingly. Um, he is. The reason he says that is because he is a criminal justice major. And I said to him after the first day of class, Oh, so. Oh, did you take this class because you like to read? <laughs> he said, no, I took it because it fits my schedule. <laughs> and so I immediately loved him because of his honesty. <laughs> and also, uh, we have really come to value deeply the contributions that he's made to class um, discussion. So um, this has been a real pleasure for me to uh, work with these students. And we have a guest who frequents our class, uh, Ms. Alona Burdett, who's the head of library services here at St. Catherine. And again, just has uh, really brought into our conversation some much needed uh, levity at times and also some really wonderful insight, uh, particularly into the practicalities of rural life. Um, so the project that we have for you all today is um, really a, a kind of interesting intersection between what Wendell Berry deals with and what's going on in our own community. Um, we have representatives, uh, we have Chris Martini, who is in charge, I, I, I will apologize in advance because I will butcher your title, but he is, uh, works parish with outreach. Oh, oh that's it. easy. Okay, parish <laughs> outreach. Else, <laughs> and he works with refugee services with Catholic charities based in Louisville. And we have also with us Buddha Sabini, who is also, uh, you, are you employed by Catholic yeah. charities? Okay, he, uh, he will talk to us today about his involvement with the RAP program, which is um, an acronym for Refugee Agricultural Partnership Program, which has just been doing some really phenomenal work in Louisville with community gardens and market gardens for refugee uh, populations in uh, Louisville. I just want to very briefly give you an idea about how we're thinking about this um, as a class and how this intersects with uh, Wendell Berry's writing. Uh, one of the primary concerns in Barry's work is the ways in which people uh, connect to their communities and the ways that they establish roots in place, and especially uh, concerned with how they are able to establish long-term and lasting affiliations and affections for place. Well, people who are refugees face really particular challenges uh, for that. Um, so. Uh, you know, we're really curious about how people who come to this community are able to use agricultural production as a means for rooting themselves, pardon the pun, uh, rooting themselves in this place and developing different kinds of community connections. Um, so I will, uh, that, was a, that was a longer introduction than I anticipated, but um, 
But um, I'll turn it over to Chris and Buddha so that they can tell you all about their programs. And then what we will do after is uh, the students have generated a list of uh, discussion questions. And what we'll do is we'll pose those to um, Buddha and Chris, but also ask for the audience to chime in to the conversation so that this is indeed a discussion um, from this community that's here in this room. So thank you all so much for traveling from Louisville at, for, well, late in the afternoon, let's just say, um, and for, for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I'll go ahead and pass on some brochures just on uh, the Catholic Charities Refugee Service in general, so that'll take away a lot of the, the explaining the really mundane stuff, but there's nothing wrong with criminal justice. That was one of my majors. So. <laughs> But uh, so, uh, so we work with the refugee service program, and the main thing we do is we service, obviously, service the refugee population is our primary concern. And that could be anybody from whom that has been forced to leave their home to some sort of persecution, whether that be religious, gender, race, creed, um, even economic reasons, they speak out against the government, anything like that, where they felt in fear for their lives and couldn't practice. And it'll live freely, except like refugees. So, excuse me, if this, and this kind of part of it seems very, uh, this seems very dumbed down. I'm used to speaking to middle schoolers, so <laughs> the question's like, what does the word refugee mean? I'm trying not to uh, make it that low around here, so. But, um, so, where we come in is after they've been resettled, after they've already been accepted to be resettled in their third country. So kind of going back a little bit, and Buddha will explain a little more of the second country process because he actually lived through that. But the refugees are forced to leave their home. They don't come directly to the United States or Canada or Australia, New Zealand or uh, Germany or one of the Scandinavian countries. Those are what's called third countries. Yet, for the most part, they go through what's called secondary resettlement first, which would be like going from Bhutan to Nepal and living in an area of the country or Burma to Thailand. And living in an area where you were in the, essentially the refugee camp, where maybe you have electricity, no running water, it's a plot of land that you've been stationed, you've been given to live in for however long it is. It could be 10, 15, 20 years, full generations. And then UNHCR, the United Nations High Commission of Refugees, will come into those camps and open them up and start kind of processing through all the people in those camps to see if they're eligible to be resettled. And that, Background checks, checking out health examinations, educational things, different things like that. All sorts of background information on them to find out if they're eligible for that resettlement. And once that becomes available, you may start then go through the process that approves or denies the resettlement for however many families they are, they are able to. And that's really where we come in. At that point, if they're coming to the United States, they go through the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, which I we usually refer to in the brochure, it probably says USCCB because we love our acronyms in the Catholic Church. <laughs> so from there, they will contact us or another refugee partner in Louisville, or in the city, or sorry, the country. We are actually in Louisville, we're one of the top five cities for refugee resettlement in the country. In the last year between Catholic Charities and Kentucky Refugee Ministries, we resettled over 2,000 refugees. So we have a very large flow of refugees coming into our city. And from that point, that's where we can say if we can accept or not. Now, Louisville, we are what's called a, uh, a yes city, we can accept a lot of medical issues. We don't really turn down many uh, clients that are proposed to us. US, if USCCB asks what we can take population-wise, we give them that number. If they come to us with a case, we will most likely say yes. There's very few reasons why we would ever turn down a case, and I don't think we really do because of the medical the medical availability, the school availability, JCPS is great, they supply us with uh, English and second language teachers. And even in some of the schools here in Louisville, they also have English classes for some of the younger students that they're able to go to if they're not ready to be in a regular classroom yet. So that's really kind of the first test we do from this point is, as soon as we find out they're coming, we'll get like a four or five day notice, we'll get keys for the apartment. We'll find an apartment for them, we'll get the keys to the apartment, we furnish We put a bed, basically a table, chair, couch, um, dresser if we have it. Kind of all now we don't like you know TVs, VCRs, DVDs, whatever. It's just the very the bare essential things you need to survive. We'll put that in there. And our caseworkers will go and they'll purchase food. 
So they'll have an idea of what, most of our case workers are former refugees, refugees themselves. So they'll take food and they will, they're going to buy what they think the person would eat, what a family would eat, and what we hope would last about a week. Now, if you've been in the camp where you've been eating you know, five grams or so how many grams of rice or whatever it is, well, what we think would last you a week and what might actually last you a week could be different because maybe the first time you had that much food. So we'll stock the shelves for them. This is all maybe a day or two days before they arrive, we'll have all that done. <coughs> On the day they arrive, our caseworkers, and if we have volunteers, it's great they come to the airport and meet them, do a reception for them, welcome them, and from there our caseworkers take them to their home, and we'll spend out how long it takes showing them how everything works. Maybe if you've been in the camp for how many years, maybe you've never had it in the front door. Maybe you've had a door that locks, show how the deadbolt works, turn the lights switch on and off. Again, probably no electricity or running water. There's between hot and cold water. If you want your stove, you don't put your hand on, show them the difference there. All those kind of real basic things that we take for granted, we show, I have to show our clients how to do. So after that, it's all in that first week then, we're getting them social security numbers, food stamps, any sort of medical screening. They're required to have a medical screening within that first month that there's any medical emergency treatment that has to happen, we get that sort of beat. After that, there's cultural orientations we do once a week to help get them acclimated to the society and handy different things. A lot of countries, the police are feared. I'm trying to show them, you know, police are friends, the police are, or the government's feared, so maybe they don't want to use a bank. They're afraid of putting money in a bank. So teaching them how that works in America. Also with that, that's all run through our English and Second Language School. So with that orientation, they're also being put into classes. We have six different levels of classes that go from someone who has no formal education, maybe illiterate in their own written language, or working to teach them English. So that can be something as simple as writing a name, memorizing the days of the week, their home address. Real basic, almost what we, what we call it is kind of like you're teaching kindergarten. There's real basic levels of things. All the way up through, maybe we have clients who are, who have their PhDs and a master's degree something. So those higher level classes are teaching them job skills, teaching them interview techniques, how to write a resume in English. So kind of all, we really run the game on those skills. We also have driving classes, healthcare sort of thing. Um, we do parenting classes for if you have kids and once they're put in the school. So a lot of the parenting classes are designed around how the public school system works. And in Louisville especially, how the busing system is supposed, well, it's supposed to work. So if anybody's dealt with that, dealing with all the busing systems and things like that. So it's teaching all those different things. And then finally, the biggest thing, what all this is working towards, we have six month contracts with them. The government says in six months, we want them to be working towards self sufficiency, self sustainability. Now, it sounds, you know, back six months, and we cut off some of our financial assistance, but that's mainly because we have somebody else going behind those clients. It's not a six months of our habits. We're having people arriving that entire time, so we have such a high number of clients we have to serve that we can't afford, you know, financially or even labor wise for the manpower to assist clients for the amount of time we, some of them need the help for. So the main goal is employment. And we have an employment team who goes out and searches for jobs then in some field. Now ideally we'd like to find something in the field they have a background in. That's not always possible. A lot of times it's taking the first shot that comes available, which could be a lot of our employees work for uh, Swift Meatpacking, Tyson Chicken, work in the hotels, work, you know, maybe lawn care or manual labor sort of jobs, just to get that first job and begin to gain some sort of financial security so they're able to look for better jobs, maybe get to move to a better home, buy a car, afford those things that every American usually has or that they want to have that, that are like kind of basic amenities. So it's really kind of a very quick overview of what uh, we do to kind of change for the refugee resettlement process. And there's a number of other pieces in there. There's, we have cars, we do, so the medical thing is its own. The other side we do uh, mental health services, we do all sorts of things in that. But yeah, that's almost another presentation in itself, right, how in-depth it is. So go ahead and uh, let Buddy give you a quick kind of overview of where he's from and how he came to work for the Catholic Charities. And then hopefully, uh, I think we're both looking forward to the discussion questions. First and foremost, I'm very lucky to see you over all here. As uh, I am all the way from Bhutan, and it's a very small and beautiful country. It's naturally very beautiful. Um, and 
Yeah, this is the... <laughs> it's a smart board, you touch it, things happen. <laughs> I'm not doing any of that. It goes to the important part. It's a, um, like a chart in our uh, in Bhutan. It's a religious building, and it is called Jong, D J O N G. Jong, they used to say, and they, they used to celebrate over Hinduism over here. It's the monastery, what we say. So. And uh, I'm just all the way from there. It's a very small, it's beautiful country. It's economically, it's very rich, but politically, it's minus, in minus. Politically, it is in minus. So, so I have to be here because of the political situation. So it's just opposite part of our world because we are having day here. The people over there, they are busy snoring now. Yeah, just <laughs> they are in the way. And actually, we had to leave the country because of many reasons, as Chris just mentioned some of the reasons that we are main, mainly we are seeking the human rights and democracy. So, but the person who raised the voice for human rights and democracy are just killed in the National Assembly. And women rights, those who raised the women rights, they were also just killed in the General Assembly, National Assembly. And then we had to force, we were forced to leave our country. So they have just given certain deadline to leave the country, to leave the village. Otherwise, they are just going to give our, the fire the home, kill the people. They are just not keep doing, they are just doing their, not in one part of the country, but in every part of the country. Most probably the group passed. Actually, the people, those who are there, are two, uh, divided into two groups. And group pass are the uh, actually monastical people, the people from the king side, king seat. So they are used to live in the northern part of Bhutan. And the Nepali people used to stay in the southern part of Nepal, the southern part of Bhutan. It was very good. The soil was very good, and everything was very good and nice. So they came to know that, okay, the part, southern part is very good, and they, are, they were in northern part, they came to know that southern part is very good. And then they used to come to southern part, they used to fire the people's house, they used to chase, they used to kill, whatever they used to like to do, and they used to start doing the same all. So the government gave the notice, okay, you have to leave the country. So we were forced to leave the country, being as refugee, so it is, there is a very long story that if I start now, then it, it takes maybe hours, not only days and days. So, but you start, as we raised the voice for human rights and democracy, we were not uh, supposed to get, we are not supposed to raise the voice, the government said, and then they started to kill the people. So I myself, it's not a story, I myself just run two nights two days and two nights in jungle just to cross the border of the country by having only some stuff like clothes and a little bit of rice in the jungle and then we just crossed the border we just went to India just immediately southern part of uh, uh, Bhutan is India and then we just went to India <laughs> I haven't told you <laughs> <laughs> um, very sensitive okay. you were so, close enough to it okay. So, so he's down here. Yeah, India, and then we just went to India, but we seek the settlement for from India, but India did not give us. So we have to run towards the Nepal. This is the third country from Bhutan. Here. So it is, yeah, that this here, side, this, over here. Yeah, this here, and we seek um, the settlement or the shelter there, and then we stayed for 20 years in Nepal in a refugee camp. Wow. 20 years in refugee camp. And the camp used to be so miserable. So there is only plastic tent, tent house, just with the four um, poles. And then we used to get little bit rice, little bit uh, poles, little bit vegetable. That last, only we used to get 500 grams of rice for 15 days for one people, one person. So that has to be just divided into many families and then many people in camp. 
So, so that is the yeah. This is this is the cam that after getting yeah, there's a fire. Yeah, there's fire. The and came. the cam it was maybe fourteen hundred hearts, fourteen hundred small houses were there in a camp, big camp. It was totally fired once it was totally fired. Nobody just but the personally nobody get hurt, but the properties all everything turns into S. So so we just spend that sort of life. But I am just here to speak according to the uh, as agriculture also. I'm just connecting to the agriculture as well as my story from the beginning. As Bhutan is a uh, mainly agricultural country, main occupation of the Bhutan is agriculture. And especially they used to grow paddy and corn and then millet and this, these are the main kind of food crops. And in cash crops, there it is very, very rich in cash crops. The cash crops are oranges and cardamom. Orange and cardamom are the main two cash crops, cash crops in Bhutan. Because of that only, its economic condition was really high. It is economically very rich because of the cardamom and orange. So they used to sell up to, up to just all the world, I mean, just up to Germany, Australia, even America, and then everywhere. So agriculture country. So at the time that we left our country, it was in the uh, month of May or June. June, it was in the May of, uh, month of June that we left our country. So the, the season in our country is only two, summer season and winter season. So it's not, and it is because of the cold. So we used to get paddy, and then in the same place, we used to have the corn, our potato, our mustard, we in the same place. Just having, we did not have the multiple crossing, cropping. So we do not have, because we need to delay, uh, depend upon only one kind of crops in one season and other kind of crop in other season. So, and at the time that we left our country, we had got a lot of cattle. In our country, we are, uh, the people are uh, considered rich because of the number of sons or because of the number of cattle. <laughs> yeah. Not, not by the number of uh, or the amount of money that they have, because whenever we have more sun, more work, and then whenever more cattle, so more uh, business. I mean, so and then we only had got maybe more than twenty-five cattle in our home, and we had got uh, three acres of crops, and we we applied there for paddy, you know, rice. So we had got a lot of. Terrace, we used to say they call it terrace for the rice or paddy. We had got a lot of three acres of terrace and which is full of paddy rice. So at the time that we used to, we lose or we untie that 25 cattle to the rice and to the corn, to the ivory crops. I mean. So I was very small at the time and I used to ask my parents the question, why? Why we are just giving the cattle to eat all the paddies or all the rice? This is just for us. Everybody, every year you used not to do that, but this year why? Why you are doing? My parents used to be full of tears and they did not give me the answer. So, I, but again, I'm just I was asking them, and then they are just packing all everything, and then they were say, they said that we are gonna go to our grandmother's home, but. But I did not know where my grandmother's home because I was very small and it was in Nepal actually. So I was told that okay, we are going to the grandmother's home. But the cattle, they are just lose the cattle and then the cattle were very busy eating all rice and all every crops. And my parents were full of tears and they just carried a bag. And then I used to ask the question frequently, why we are living? Why the sea, the cattle are just busy eating the crops. So. Uh, by the time that uh, they, they used to be full of tears and they did not ask, uh, they did not answer me the, uh, my questions answer, so, and then we had to leave that day. And the, by the way that in the jungle that we used to live in very bad place, we have to cross the river, jungle, there was only the river that we need to take the water for, 
and when we just take the water from the river, my sister had got a leech in the nose and that was just gone bigger and bigger in two days only. So it was really big. When, we, when she tries to, do, tries to drink the water, it comes just from here. My dad tries to catch it, but it is very clever. It was very clever, it just go. And when finally, just my father was able to catch it and then just pull it, sister went faint for one whole night. And we were just sitting there. We are not scared of the tiger, we are not scared of the snakes. But we, still we were scaring for the people, for the army and police that they are just gonna come and kill us. And then we just cross the border. And when we come to Nepal, and in camp, that as I've already said, the camp, it was only the plastic with the four poles. When the storm comes, we have to catch four corners. And when it rains, we have to be just a cluster in between the plastic and just cook food and eat it. So that was of the food we used to cook with the charcoal. And there was no electricity, there was no, mm, nothing else. No electricity. Just we used to use the charcoal to eat, cook the food. And we used to, that has got the COPD and asthma because of that uh, charcoal smoke. And uh, we have to use, and we study, I studied, fortunately I studied, because the education in Bhutan was also very good. Because our brothers and sisters had also come along with us, and they started to teach us, even though it, is, it was under the tree. We used to go under the tree, in the shade of the tree, and then we used to learn. We used to listen at least what the brothers and sisters says. Okay, for example, okay. Um, Subject plus Bob plus object. Boy eats banana. That what is the subject? Boy. We have to remember all everything. And exam also, they used to ask us, okay, tell me the uh, sentence which has got subject, Bob, object. Okay, then we used to say that, okay, he is eating uh, apple. So we have to find out who, what is he, what is eating, and what is an apple. So that is our school. That in that way we just learned. So slowly, and then but then also there were brothers and sisters. Luckily, we just got at least just to get learn English. That's why I'm just here. And then I thank even that day. Or I thank still my brothers that day. They had helped us just to learn. Then so that I can speak like this here as well. And that. There's the camp life, and then fortunately, we try to return back to Bhutan, but Bhutan just denied to take us back. And many of the international agencies came over to the camp and we requested them. So once we get, we got the life in this art that's also gonna go in the dark. So please let us help, and let, let's get help, or help us. Then they just started to, talk to the government of Bhutan, but it was not successful. And by the way, that third country settlement by the UNHCR, uh, United High Commission for Refugees, and then UNO, United Nations Organizations, and all of the international agencies have talked, and then they just started the process for third country settlement. And now we are just um, maybe 100, thousand people are already settled in other countries. So the countries are like Australia, Canada, New Zealand, America, and then U United Kingdom. Then these are all other countries and other many more. So we have just got good chance and what we think, what I think and what our people thought that, okay, our black part of our life has been just gone. So. And when we just were in camp, and where we are going, my parents and all used to ask the person who knows at least English, where we are going. So we are going to the America, or where we are going to Australia. So, but they are now, still now, they are just totally zero. They are in zero. Because when they go out of the home, they do not know how to speak English. If somebody comes there and, uh, okay, I'm just gonna uh, kill you, let's go and then they will just go. Whatever they said, they do not know. 
So they do not understand any. That means, I mean, the language barrier is the big problem here. So um, they just, when they look TV also, they do not know, do not understand the language. So what we just created for that is that we are looking for something, some way so that they can just pass their time and they just forget their feelings or they just regrets so they can just be just engaged in some of the things. So we just started talking about the gardening. So so that they can just whatever the work they have just done in their country or in their they have done in their own land or own country. So if they have got their experience, they have got their knowledge. So if we just provide at least the land just to engage them there, so that may help us to forget the regrets and all the uh, past activities so that we just talk about and finally we just got able. Just I was, I was interpreting for the program from since when I was here and I also used to attend some meetings and I used to raise this kind of uh, issues and then finally UK um, University of Kentucky just got approved that they are just kept two of uh, us. I mean, I am just uh, working there in that position. Uh, I'm community agriculture educator there, here, and then I'm just, uh, and that is my happiest part. As I was teaching there, my small uh, brothers and sisters in camp after getting my education, and by coming here, I did not get the chance to teach in the like, same way that I was doing in there. And that was, I was just also, oh, America is not good for me. Because I was there a teacher, teaching students, and then just having fun, no, just, I mean, we have got the dignity, so, but here, no. So, can I go to school? No, you have to have the equivalent, or you have to have the graduation year, master's year, from any year else. So, that is my happiest point that I've got the at least a uh, good way of helping the people. I can help the people, those who can't speak and all. So I'm just <coughs> helping the people just to grow and pass their time. At least my point of view is that gardening is the another part, but the way that I'm just doing or helping them is that they just forget their feelings, forget their uh, just uh, <coughs> depressions or activities that so I'm just turning them and when I'm just working with the garden I just used to tell them the story and then and I just keep them in a view of our just um, feeling that they might they just do the competition in the garden also and I used to tell them okay those who goes uh, good way those who grow biggest pumpkin <coughs> I'm gonna give Twenty dollar gift card. So, in that way, I'm just doing. I'm just doing or making them engaged and thinking about the same process there, and let them forget the other thing, whatever they have just done. So that's that is the other part. So that the gardening is not only the growing fruits and vegetables and eating, but that is the other subject, other part that is really important. That's the that is what I was thinking, and I'm just doing now. That is what I'm satisfied with. The gardening program, and and the other thing is that I was also um, my father was also a uh, farmer, and then I know more or less the farming way, but of Bhutan and Nepal. But when I come here, our people, our, our parents did not do not know what the soil test is. Oh, I last last time when I just tell the people, okay, we are just doing the soil test of the. A garden. So w let's re uh, wait for the result of the soil test, and then we'll s we'll start tilling, and then we'll just start doing our cropping. And the people get some soil test. <laughs> is the soil is sick? <laughs> <laughs> now they used to ask me the question. So do you think the soil is sick? Why you have to test? The blood pressure of the soil is high. <laughs> so they used to go in that way. So they do not have idea anyway, because they but. But then also they know, they used to know by their experience. They do not, they did not read the books, but they do know by their experience. If there's, uh, if what the, what kind of uh, disease or what is less for the soil, they used to know by the kind of experience of the long time, 
this to get uh, the fertilizer or the chemical or whatever they, the, the plant needs, this to buy. For, but here, so for example, my uncle is just a car a truck driver when I, uh, we were in Nepal. And here, last time we were driving together. I also noticing that, okay, something is going wrong to the, my car. And what he is noticing, and he is just giving concentration to the car, and he's just, I was driving, he said, put your car aside. Put your car aside. There something is going wrong in your car. Okay, and then the tire is gonna flat at the same time, and I just put the car aside. And I have just got that, um, Zach, what is that? Jack. 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 And, but, he knows everything when he was in Nepal or uh, Bhutan, just to fix the and just re, uh, change the tire. But I have just shown him, okay, this is the jack, just work it. But he did not know how to do that. Anyway, that's the difference that what I mean to say is that there's the different difference between the way that they have done here and the way that they have they are doing here is completely different. So I am helping them as much as I can. And then I am also just collecting the experience also from here as Chris um, is helping me, as I, we have got other rap program, all, and uh, some of the schools are helping us, some of the charts are helping, helping us just to go and just get the things done. So the way that we are just, we were going there and here is quite different. For example, that they have just not done the soil test anytime. So we are here doing the soil test. We are finding the pH value of the soil here. We are finding the uh, percentage of ni uh, nitrogen. Okay, but they do not know what the nitrogen is. What they do not know completely what it is. But, and at the time now, in our country, there were no comparison to here. Last year, we had got many box and pests. So, but when we were in Bhutan, not that much pest and box they were talking about. So, and they used to use the organic things. They used not to use the chemicals. So they used to use the organic. For example, cow dung. Cow dung, this is the main uh, manure or the fertilizer they used to, we used to use in Bhutan and Nepal. But here, we, just, we are just familiar with the, I, I am just using there for the cotton seeds particularly, and then at last we are just <coughs> 10, 10, 10, at last. So we are not familiar with the all kind of organic things also, and as we are, uh, and I have started the work in RAP program last February, February 5th, 2013. So it has been a year, and I'm just collecting experience and would like to collect more, and then would like to help the people and all. So now I would like to have questions if you have anyone. Uh, before we get into the discussion, just some detail questions. So how many uh, countries are represented in the RAP program? Oh, uh, there are many countries, uh, many country peoples. So Cafeteria in general is over 40. We reset, we reset over 40 countries. Over so, 40, oh yeah. wow. We've been doing, doing this for almost 40 years. Wow. So there could be any number of People hailing from countries, lots yeah. of different The gamut in the 70s, obviously, 70s Vietnam, we have first Southeast Asian refugees, yeah. we have Burmese, we have Nepal, um, African countries, Darfur, Vietnam. Sudan, um, Burma. Somalia, Burma, um, Sierra Leone, Burundi, um, a lot of Cuban, yeah. probably easily. Our top five refugees right now, <laughs> instead of going through all, every country I can think of, are um, Cuba, they're number one or so, and that's a completely different, they're secondary cases from the asylum programs. So it's kind of one point where you get on American soil, you can request asylum if you're from Cuba because of political and economic reasons. So it's Cuba, Burma, Nepal, Bhutan, Somalia, and yeah. is that Iraq still? I think Iraq is still our top. Somalia. Yeah, um, Sudan, and Iraq, I think are our top yeah. ones right now. And then we also have Afghanistan, and Iran. Um, Iraq is a little more because of the, it's called SIB. It's if you, SIV is basically if you work with the American government as like a linguist or something that way we, it's kind of a priority for Rissell. It's a special, special immigration visa is what it stands for. And so if you work with that group, you obviously, as soon as you work for the American government as a, 
as someone from that country, you're considered a traitor to your home country, so we do everything we can at our power to quickly get them out of the country when it becomes the point of danger for their families. We will we move their families quicker from the country. So about how many, uh, so they, they're representing a broad swath yeah, of countries, but yeah. about how many families are participating in the REF program? Uh, yeah, from my community, uh, maybe 120 families are there. That's, that's just from the Burmese? Or the no, just from um, the Nepali. Nepali communities. Yeah. Overall, are there, are there other nationalities? That yeah, yeah. There are, no, we have got the mainly, we have got three gardens. And one garden is in Seventh Street Garden. We used to say it is in Seventh Street. That's why we used to say Seventh Street Garden. There are thirty by thirty plots are there, and there are two hundred and fifty-four plots, and that's one garden. So, and the other garden is there. Um, there are maybe hundred plots, thirty by thirty, on the other side. That's in South Side Drive. Right? Yeah. Yeah. South Side Drive would probably have a lot of Iraqi. I'm just trying to think where they probably yeah. in what they're, apartment they're complex. Kind of to, pulling people from you pull areas, people from the, right? You're pulling people from the areas where they yeah. where they yeah, live, where and that's live. South Side Drive. Um, we have the lot of apartments there within Kingston Park um, by the Americana Center and by St. John Vianney. If anyone knows where that is, we have a lot. Of Eleven Oaks and South Side Drive with a lot of our fives in those apartments. And then the other garden, this year only, uh, there is one charge, St. Ignatius charge. So, and the Marcy Academy School from Guadu, they are going to help oh, us. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, and we are just starting from this year, that one. As I have already got 34 growers there, I have registered 34 growers. And that's and off, uh, that'll be off, the, off of um, the Fagan Bush area, by where, between Mercy and uh, kind of back over LG, LG is. Uh, Right about G, 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 um, oh, sorry, G, G, yeah, G, yeah. yeah. G so it's Newburgh, uh, Poplar Level, all over in that area. We have a lot of our clients live over in that area as well. And can you tell us just a little bit about the um, the people who are marketing the produce that they grow and where they're selling it and how that? Okay. Yeah. So actually, um, our community people, they are just uh, last year and before last year, they were just produced for their my family consumption. And one family, one uh, couple is there, and I have just given a small report to the Lord and also my supervisor mm -hmm. when I was just working with last time. And the garden for them is the medicine for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the couple is there, those who are, uh, they both are diabetic patients, and they do not have children. Mm -hmm. And then the guy, he was just uh, crying with me. He was just requesting me that we need to get the garden first, when we had no garden. So we just talked about it, and then we just provided them. And he only sold, from the two plots of 30 by 30, he sold $1,400 within the community. And from my other friend, from a Somalian friend, he had just got two clients or three clients, they have sold 5,000 of each the, in the community. And that's market. through farmer's markets and? Yeah, through yes. the farmer's markets. One of the places is uh, St. Francis of Assisi on Barstown Road. Uh -huh. On Sundays after Mass, they will have um, where she's from. Uh, she's from um, Skanda? She's from Burundi. Yeah. Okay, she's Burundi, and uh, I can't give her name either right now. But she uh, sits, sits up a market, and their uh, Fred Whitaker, who does the after school and the, the uh, religion programs there, he has some of his students come out, and they'll help uh, sell. They'll kind of bag up and sell the vegetables and different things for her, and it's like, I think it's a dollar for anything there. And she does, after the mass, they do a very good uh, business. People will kind of go by and they'll buy the fresh produce. Now it's starting. That's just <laughs> recently started. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Captive audience. <laughs> and we have just run to many big companies also. They, we used to take give them the brochure, and they used to demand, okay, we need okras, and we need tomatoes, and we used to take them with the and run to the many companies. So it's I mean, uh, in single, it's highly demand. It's highly demanded. The organic garden or organic vegetable. Mm -hmm. So he had just uh, he sold and he had just got no uh, kids. 
and then he is just working every time in the garden and then he is diabetic patient and what I came to know and what we found is that whenever he had garden in summer his sugar level is really low <laughs> and in winter it goes up and he gets sick all the time in home so and then we just found uh, that is that is what um, I am looking or that is the positive part of the gardening and that what I would like to just get them grow and just go and go. So that we just found and that is the uh, way that I, we are just looking for other parents, other couples or other people as well. So we are trying to raise the garden or increase the garden and try to engage them in the garden. and. Um, Directly or indirectly, they are just getting well, and they are getting fresh vegetables just to take there, feed the children, and then feed the community and country as well. I think we have some other questions. <laughs> well, I'm understanding at some point that it's possible for you to return to your home country. Uh, that is when, if we return to, for example, if I were in Nepal and try to return to my country, so I have to, I do not have to love myself, then return to my country. If they only see, they're just gonna kill, directly. It, it was unsafe when he tried yeah. to, they wouldn't let, allow them back into yeah. Bhutan when his family tried to return. Now once he has a citizenship here, and after five years, uh -huh. so two more years of being here, he'll be eligible to become a US citizen, then obviously he can get the passport and the visa and everything, yeah. and he can go, you would be able to travel, but yeah, that's after having citizenship, we have to after getting visa or passport, then we may visit, but they will track the people automatically. I guess before you guys want to discuss one thing, um, you're asking about ways to get involved, and one of the ways we're talking about, he was talking about the Garden with Mercy and saying Ignatius, is that right? Um, thank you. So that's going to be starting up here soon. Mercy's going to be doing, involved in that, and we can always ask the volunteer page. So if anybody's interested in one, yeah. you can start. Uh, there, you're eligible to kind of you can help maybe grow the garden, help starting off the clients who need the help. Like you said, don't know how to do the pH levels. Some of the more, well, more complicated things, and the more I mean, things we do here that maybe weren't the natural in their home country. At the same time, even as helping with what they already do know, so they can always use help them, especially when we have our all of our elderly clients work with that. So the, some of the physical labor is not as possible for them, so we're always looking for help in that respect too. So especially soon to live in Louisville, or, or we'll be visiting Louisville over the uh, summer break, uh, consider picking up the information about volunteering. And this is a very general, it's a general volunteer form, but you can, uh, I'll leave some of my contact okay. information, and I can get in touch with Buddha and Mark Bouchard, and I'll be doing some more work with them, this year, getting that coordinated, so you guys are directly coordinated with the RAP program instead of going through our general volunteer. Uh, oh, okay. Field, which takes a little longer, it'll take a little longer to process because of the general volunteer uh, program. Other questions? I just want to say I am very impressed with everything that the two of you are doing. Wow. A, a tie in uh, the property on Southside Drive uh, was first owned by the Dominican sisters who live here and sponsored this college mm -hmm. and um, I was back I was there two years ago or um, something and I've spent a considerable number of years there prior to the changeover and so you know in a very kind of spiritual way we we still have uh, a lot of interest in what happens there and how the needs of people in that area are being met. So uh, there's a kind of kinship with you all on what you're doing there. So we're, we're very happy with that connection. Are, are folks from a variety of religious traditions that come here, the refugees? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. The kind of things we say, uh, one of the kind of lines we use a lot, especially with MRS, is we don't do this work because we're Catholic. In fact, the majority of our staff really isn't even Catholic. It's just we don't do it because anybody, well, we don't do it because anybody else is Catholic. Because it's, we do because it's you know Catholic social teaching says it's what you do. You welcome this change. You help for the need. So for me, it's like no, I say yes, I am Catholic, but that has nothing to do with 
I just, for me, it's the right thing. It's the human rights sort of thing. So, but the majority of our clients are, uh, you know, Cuban clients obviously are more likely to be, you know, probably, some of them are more Catholic. We have a lot of Hindu, we have Muslim, we have any religion you can think of really from, because the majority of our clients do come from Middle Eastern and African countries. Just one more quick question. Will you guys have a presence at the Festival of Faith coming up? Because I know the topic is has to do with soil and um, soil. We usually, um, this one, is that the ear, one of the Iroquois No. Is that, no. Uh, actors this year. The actors? Oh, yeah, actors. I'm sure we will. Um, <laughs> it would make sense. <laughs> we, all, we are rid of all those different things. I'm trying to, I get those kind of all confusing which ones we do, but I'm sure we will have some sort of, we'll have a booth there or something. We usually do, um, we have four or five emails that come out recently about different things we're signed up for. I'm sure that was, that was probably one of my right, right, had a chance to look at it yet. But. No, most likely we will have a, um, we have a information booth anywhere at those sorts of events. We always have an informational booth with not only about MRS, but about Mother of Care, about prison ministries, um, elderly programs we have. So the Catechary's isn't just Migration Review Service. Now, we work with the MRS office, but we have a number of other programs that Catholic Charities serves. So. As time goes on, do you foresee that maybe some of the refugees who live in Louisville would want to uh, work land in the more rural areas? Because we have a whole lot of land in the rural areas and a need for more workers. And you all have workers, but probably not very much land. So some transportation issue there that we have. Yeah. A lot of our, most a lot of our clients don't have cars, don't have that transportation. Mm -hmm. They rely on the tarp or on a bicycle for transportation. But, I just, I mean, but it might be possible to think down the line about mm -hmm. some kind of a little bus service, a mini bus. And we've been working with them. We work with Sister Mary Schmuck from the. Um, this is a, uh, she has parish social ministry out this way from the uh, Sister Natalie, and she does a lot of the. I'm sure that's probably on her list of uh, things that she's bringing. So she has uh, brought that up before, and I think that's something with some development, we can easily create that kind of development for yeah. it. And I think, mm -hmm. I mean, you were telling me yeah. your way out here, how much you like to lay hand in the... Yeah, yeah actually, I have got different clients who are really interested for chicken yeah. and then uh, goat. Okay. Yeah. She but goat? Chicken. Okay. chicken. chicken. Chicken and chicken, and chicken, chicken. Bun, like, oh, yeah. you're on and but the but the problem is here as we just get small help for eight months from the Catholic charities, yeah. then we are responsible for the rain and algae and else, everything else. So when they if there are two people just to get go and work and just earn the money, so if they start the job like raising goat, they need to go away. Mm -hmm. And they are the the children on the side. They don't have good economic condition, mm -hmm. so they are. That is the problem they are they are facing now. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I have got many people those who are really interested for raising goats and chickens. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there are possibilities of like the financial burden is kind yeah, of that first and foremost <coughs> the financial burdens that we have to yeah. overcome for all of that. Mm -hmm. So maybe down the line, that's a down the line sort of thing. Hopefully. We can. And uh, so far, we have just given and the language barrier, as I've already said. And uh, if there are any person, if you would like to uh, help them, the farmers, and they need help certainly at the time of selling the produce. So they have the produce, but they do not know how to explain it. So For going example, to, going oh, to it the is, markets with yeah, them. it is harvested in the morning. It is totally organic, so it is very fresh. It's good for health. So it is harvested in the morning, it is very good. So at least they can tell that, like that. Mm -hmm. So but, and the uh, produce which is of pure organic doesn't look like Kroger's, doesn't and look yeah. like Walmart. Yeah. yeah. And at that time, they need help, some of the help if they need. And last time I just worked with the many uh, children with the high school, many students with the high school, and they helped for them to sell the produce. Just, they just bridge the gap of language and then they, they just solve the problem. And other way, if uh, anybody is interested for the people, those who are elderly people, so they can just, uh, they uh, or you all can help them for getting the citizenship, for example, citizenship questions and citizenship test questions and all everything. That is the other part. 
And for the RAP program, as we, Chris has already said, and we are just setting more and more new gardens, and uh, we need more help and more people, more produce. Yeah. And the basic point of thing is that as I, I was there, and I started to just print out the papers and the names from the Nepali and in English, I have just done printed in this way, and then I have just started to giving the people. And by the time that they have started, but now, they at least know the name of the vegetable now. If we say just okra, then they understand okra means this one. Yeah. So if it says green beans, okay, they realize that okay, green beans, okay, this is the green beans. Okay. By the time it's going, then they are just learning some more stuff. They are learning, they are learning something at least. So we just for us. Yeah. I think Addison has a question for us. Uh, I was just wondering, is like security an issue like ever? Do you guys have any like issues with like theft uh, of like the like the produce and stuff? Yeah, like uh, for the gardens per se, like downtown or not? Yeah. Is there a problem like people breaking into? Because in the street, there are two hundred and fifty-four plots, and at the time that it is everything grows there, it is sure. really attractive. And we do not have the fence over the garden, mm -hmm. so there are big neighbor near. So, but then also we have just put the camera last year. So, but we see the camera that the people are just taking in the camera also. But we cannot go and, <laughs> get, we cannot, we cannot go and just uh, yesterday you just take something and okay, just, unfortunately it's a hard thing to prove. That's, like that's very hard to yeah. prove because one, yeah. yeah. the ownership rights to it, and everything else with. Yeah. And if you eat it, how am I going to prove you? <laughs> so I say, hey, you took this, okay? Yeah. If it's gone, what am I going to do with that? That's, uh, that's only for the namesake, the camera. Okay, then, yeah, that, that's a lot. That And the people, what I used to say that is that, okay, don't worry. They do not have government. They are hungry, they took it. That's all. So they won't come again and again. So we don't, don't, there's not much of a problem with the one that's outside drive, though, is there? there is there still is. a problem with that one, yeah. too? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And that's the important part. We don't have, you know, there might be a fence going around that you can't, mm -hmm. you know, people yeah, can still go, you can climb fences, you can go over, so it's. Yeah, we talked street. about the fencing of the 7th Street last time with the uh, extension office, and it is really expensive. They said it is really expensive, we can do that. That's all. That's all. But we, are, we are trying it. <laughs> Yeah, and then at last we used to have some questions to the growers. How did you do? How much did you produce? How much did you distribute? How much did you sell? And what kind of help from the RAP program? Which were the major problems last year? And having the questions from the uh, growers, we used to, we tried to solve the problems year by year. And uh, we are just having feedbacks and evaluations and all everything. <laughs> Um, one of the questions we produced in class was, um, are there any plants or produce that we that are brought over from other countries and adapted to grow here, or do you only grow um, produce that is native to here? Yeah, they're very good question. Because these are all going to be here. They are kind of No, people like okay. For example, uh, people like whatever they are eating. They just get too scared to eat the unknown thing. Mm -hmm. So. For example, the um, bitter gourd, you know bitter gourd? Bitter gourd? B-I-T-T-E-R. Bitter gourd. Oh, bitter gourd. Yeah, I can't talk about that yet. Bitter gourd. B-I-T-T-E-R. This one? No, it's bitter gourd. Bitter gourd. Yeah, this is the one. It's really bitter. Have you tasted? Uh, have you seen this? No. 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 It's really bitter. It's really bitter. It says never eat. So. 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 My favorite. This is this is the one. So we have to we have to slice it like this, like this, and throw some salt, and then leave it 
the green water will come and that the salt beater will absorb the beater, beater, beater taste yeah. and then we'll just let it to dry a little bit and then we'll just fry the tomato at first mm -hmm. and then we'll just put it this one and just fry it just uh, maybe not gravy but just fry it totally mm -hmm. and then just we eat it. It will be a little bit bitter but the tomato will just there just make it the tasty. Yeah. So, but see here, whatever we like will just grow and eat. Whatever we don't like, we haven't seen yet. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that is the way that they are doing. So actually all the vegetables are similar here, but the thing that they grow like this, mm -hmm. and the long beans, and uh, okras, and uh, hot piper, these all are the different things that you'll be seeing in the garden. Mm -hmm. there. Yeah. I don't like that. <laughs> uh, your mom's given me before. I didn't like it. One of our, one of our uh, co-workers is from Nepal. He brings that into work a lot. And it's an <laughs> acquired taste. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so these are different um, uh, according to the taste. They just go for whatever their experience as well as their taste. Yeah. Well, how, the question that, uh, this is a question that the, one of the students who's not here today um, posed and her question is how has the RAT program made made it easier for people to connect with the community that they live in now? I mean it seems like part of what you said is that they're kind of able to bring a little bit of their home and to feel more comfortable but is there a way that growing and gardening and being in a community garden has helped people to settle in? You talk about it gets away from that kind of that depression, the things they miss yeah. from home. Like, yeah. But especially for our elderly clients, because it's something they know and they can yeah. meet. Mm -hmm. Because they're not working, they're not getting out of their homes. Wow. It's a way to help and them. And they're meeting people too, I yeah. imagine. I mean, is it, a, is it common for people to come, like on Saturday morning, there'll be a lot of people working in the plot, or are there common times when there yeah, will be a lot of people working? Particularly in Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, the, the person who are working, they get off and they will just, other than, they depend upon the transportation of him yeah. also, and then they will just bring to the garden. And then I used to prepare our, the, a garden party also sometimes, mm -hmm. and then everybody used to come there and okay. eat and talk for for a while. And then I just make the competition that okay, who has got long squash, this much, who has got l plenty of okras, this this thing. So that is the part of motivation for them. And then they will just come together, and then they will just talk together. It's like the state fair, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the competitions yeah, for yeah. the pumpkin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If any, anyone else have a questions? Well, we're over our time, but I, this has just been really, um, really, I think, an important conversation for us. And um, I uh, second what um, Sister um, said earlier about uh, we have deep respect for what you're doing and appreciate you all sharing a little piece of that with us. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.